I don't know what you're facing, but here's what I do know. You've got something special. You've got greatness in you. And I know it's possible that you can live your dream. It's possible. I can do this. I can make this happen. No matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. It's possible. Yes, your dream is possible. Say that to yourself every day. Feed your mind with words that you write and words that you hear and words that you speak to yourself. Feed your faith and your doubts will starve to death. Say to yourself, it's possible. It's possible. It's possible. Even when you have no evidence to point to, say to yourself, it's possible. There's nothing as powerful as a made-up mind. It's a struggle sometimes to do that, especially when you have people around you telling you that it's not possible, that you can't do it. And they're constantly pointing out your failures of the past, constantly reminding you of all of the things that you don't have going for you. I'm reminded of the story of two little boys that were playing on, on some ice during the winter. And, and, and as they got further out on this ice, one fell through the, the thin ice. And, and so the little fellow that was still on top of the, the ice, he was trying to save his, his little buddy. And he couldn't reach him, he was trying to pull him. He could see him through the thin ice as he got further away from him, struggling. And, and he couldn't reach him and he was trying to break the ice and he couldn't do it. He looked around and he saw a tree in the distance and he ran and then he got up on the tree and, 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 and he pulled and broke down an enormous sized branch and came back and, and savagely began to beat that ice and broke it and, and miraculously he saved his friend. And when the paramedics came and they were able to revive this little boy, they were scratching their heads, they're trying to figure this out, said, how, how could this little pruny fellow go up in a tree and break off a branch this size and then come back and beat and break the ice and save his friend? They thought it was just miraculous, it was baffling. And an old guy who was there said, I can tell you how he did it. And they said, how? How did he do it? And he said, there was no one here to tell him well, what could you do? What could I do? What could all of us do if we did not have the naysayers in our lives? That, that, that we believe naively like that little boy that it was possible. What would you do if, if, if failure was not on the table? Most people are not accumulating wealth. Most people are living in poverty. Most people are living far below their potential. Not because they don't have the capacity, not because they have not been given authority and dominion over everything on the face of the earth, but most people are living like they're living because of the fact that they don't believe they can have any more than what they now have. In the book called The Miseducation of the Negro, Dr. Carter G. Woodson said, if you can determine what a man shall think, you'll never have to concern yourself with what he will do. If you can make a man feel inferior, you'll never have to compel him to seek an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. And if you can make a man feel justly an outcast, you never have to order him to go to the back door. He'll go without being told. And if there's no door, his very nature will demand one. That's why scripture reminds us, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So every day you have to sell yourself and get out of your mind those old thoughts, that old belief system. Every day you've got to sell yourself on that it's possible. That you've got to put a new mind in you. You've got to get out of your mind. You've got to begin to restructure your thinking. Every day, you've got to begin to recondition your mind. See, many of us go through life making choices, thinking it's our choices, and it's not. What do you mean by that? I'm reminded of uh, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead. She was in a restaurant in Europe, and a waiter saw her and said, Oh, how are you? I'm so glad to see you. He said, There are several other Americans here tonight. And she said, Is that right? He said, Yes. He, she said, when you serve them dessert, let me know and I'll tell you exactly how many are here. He said, that's not possible. She said, let me know after you serve dessert. When he served dessert, 
He came back and he told her. She got up, she walked around, and she looked and she observed, and she said, you have exactly 65 Americans here. He checked the guest list, and he was amazed. He said, how did you know that? She said, because in Europe, when you eat a slice of pie or cake, you eat it from the back toward the tip. In America, when we eat a slice of pie or cake, we eat it from the tip toward the back. How many of you, when you eat a slice of pie or cake, you eat it from the tip toward the back? Raise your hands, please. Good. Now, what else is in your mind? What else are you doing unconsciously that you don't even know? I'm going to say something and I want you to answer it after it. I want you to end it for me. Winston tastes good like what? How many of you don't even smoke Winston but know it? Raise your hands, please. Now, that commercial been off the air for 30 years. 30 years. See, let me share something with you. The easiest thing I've ever done was to earn a million dollars. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe it could happen to me. That was the most difficult part, to believe that given my circumstances, if my birth parents came down this aisle right now, I would not know either one if my daddy came up here or my mother came up here. Given the fact that I was born in an abandoned building on a floor, being labeled educable, mentally retarded, not having any college training, I used to feel all my life that people who had college degrees were more intelligent than me. I remember going to see the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, the author of the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, and I used to look at him up on stage and I said, I could do that. I would love to talk to people. I love to talk to people. And I said, I could do that. But then when I started going back to my car, my mental conditioning activated itself. And it said, Les Brown, you can't do that. You don't have a college education. Les Brown, you can't do that. You don't have the training. You've never worked for a major corporation. You can't do that. What makes you think you can earn five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in an hour? You don't earn that now working for two or three months. What makes you think that you can speak for AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, General Electric? These are clients I have now. You've never even worked for them. How many have ever thought about something you wanted to do and you talk yourself out of it? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. That inner conversation is what's going to haunt you after staying here and saying, I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. After saying that again and again, we are more than conquerors. That inner conversation will cause you when you leave here to go back leading a life of mediocrity, leading a life of unproductivity, leading a life of poverty. So I'm going to share with you how to break out of that. I want to share with you how to reach your goals. I think the Bible is the greatest motivational book ever been written. Now I want you to repeat after me, please. We got to recondition our minds first. Let us say together good things are supposed to happen to me. Yeah, write that down. I want you to say that to yourself every day. See, we live in a world where we believe that bad things are supposed to happen to us. I remember at a point in my life, Bishop, when things are going good for me, and I said, this is too good to be true. Something is bound to happen. Guess what? It did. Thou shalt decree a thing that shall be established unto you and shall accomplish that wherein to it has been sent. Watch your words. Watch what you say about yourself, about your affairs. Be conscious of that on a daily basis. Why? Because your words are powerful. In the beginning was the word. Life and death is in the tongue. Watch what you say. Never say I'm broke. Say I'm overcoming a cash flow problem. Claim what you want, not what you don't want. So affirm good things are supposed to happen to me and begin to believe that. Begin to expect that. Now, I was talking to my oldest son, Calvin. We were going for a walk. And I said, Calvin, do you want to be successful? He said, yes, sir, Dad. So okay. We kept on walking. Then I stopped and I looked him in the eyes. It's my namesake, my junior. I said, Calvin, we're looking at each other eye to eye now. Do you expect to be successful? Given the fact that you are a single parent of two kids, 
given the fact that you decided not to go to college to further your education, given the fact that you are very talented, but you're behind on your dreams and your bills, do you expect, based upon your performance, based upon what you produce at this point in time in your life, do you expect to be successful? And Calvin got quiet. Because see, if you ask most people at the Manpower Conference, do you want to be successful? Do you want to live a life of productivity? Do you want to live a life of contribution? Do you want to be a better father? Do you want to have your own business? Are there dreams you want? Everybody will say yes. But see, what shows up in conversation, expectation shows up in behavior. See, I can tell what you expect by what you do. That's why the Bible says, judge a tree by the fruit it bears, not the fruit that it wants, not the fruit that it talks about, not the fruit that it craves, but by what you are doing. See, what you do when you leave here, when the music stops, when the shouting dies down, your behavior, how you conduct yourself, writing your goals down, deciding to enroll in school to get a GED, deciding to sit in the class with children young enough to be your grandchildren, decide to find some product, some idea, some service that you can provide so that you can begin to create some value for yourself so you can create wealth. Now let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. It's very important that we begin to learn how to create wealth. I'm not talking about loving money. See, I believe the lack of money is the root of all evil. People are steal for money. People are killed for money. People go to jail for money. Every time the unemployment goes up, in those areas where the unemployment is high, that's where you have the highest incidence of crime and violence. Whenever the unemployment goes up 1% in our community, 10,000 children and women are battered. One money makes a difference in your life. I never wanted to be rich. All I've ever wanted to do was to be comfortable. How many of you ever want to be comfortable? Raise your hands. Then I realized in order to be comfortable, you've got to be rich. An old friend of mine, Zig Ziglar, said, people say money won't make you happy, but everybody want to find out for themselves. <laughs> Rita Davenport said, money ain't important, but it's right up there with oxygen. <laughs> and let me tell you something, fellas, even if you're as humble as I am, if you've got some money, women will find something cute on you. <laughs> he got in low like Denzel, honey. <laughs> Money makes a difference. I used to be so broke when creditors would call the house, my children would ask the phone and say, my daddy said, yeah, oh. <laughs> I was so broke at one time in my life, I walked my bank and tripped the alarm. <laughs> Number one, it gives you control over your life. Write that down. Number two, it gives you options. Three, it allows you to live a life of contribution, to contribute to things that you feel strongly about. Like this ministry and the work of Project 2000 will be doing to change the lives of young people. Bishop Jake's vision is if we can have little league football teams and baseball teams and basketball teams, then we can have little league dermatologists and cardiologists and endocrinologists. So he is now establishing an institution, Project 2000, to give our young people the methods and the techniques to reinvent themselves as we go into the next millennium. And this era that Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. So here's the first step to accumulating wealth. If you expect to do it, write this down. You must be willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. 
That's why the book of life said the road to life is straight and narrow and few there be that find it because few there be that are willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow, others won't have. What are the things that others won't do? Number one, make discipline a major force in your life. How many of you know if you'd have been more disciplined, you'd be further along to reach your goals right now? Socrates said the undisciplined life is an insane life. The road to life is straight and narrow because few there be that are willing to discipline themselves. Here's something else that most people won't do. Make it okay to fail. A lot of people, 85% of people allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. Repeat after me please. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly. Yeah, see anything is worth doing is worth doing right as we have been taught if you know how to do it. But if you don't know how to do it, it's worth doing badly until you get it right. I bet you, and I wasn't there, I bet you that when Bishop T.D. Jakes first stood up to preach, when he gave his trial sermon, he did not have the command, he did not have the mastery, he did not have the confidence, he did not have the depth, he did not have the capacity to translate and milk scripture like he did last night when he first started out. Now write this down. You don't have to be great to get started, but you have to get started to be great. The first time I stood up to speak, I stood up and my mind sat down. I looked at the audience and I panicked. I had to introduce a play at school. Uh, we're, about to, we're about to start. A, uh, uh, ran up, Mr. Washington. Mr. Brown, where are you going? Uh, Mr. Washington, I, I can't think, sir. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Did you rehearse? Yes, sir, I did. Well, what's wrong? Why did you say your lines? I, 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 don't, I don't know, sir. I, I just I got up there and I looked at him and everything left me. Let me do it another day, please, sir. No, go back out there, Mr. Brown. Mr. Washington, I'll mess up, please, sir. Don't, 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 don't send me out there now. I'll mess up. Mr. Brown, if you run now, you will always be running. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly until you get it right. Why are you moving like that? I got to go to the bathroom, sir. Mr. Brown. Go back out there. Yes, sir. We have brought to start a plea called 12 Angry Men, directed by Mr. Leroy Washington. And I ran off. The next day, hey, I fell far. They dogged me out. They talked about me so bad. The next time another event came up, Mr. Washington, Mr. Brown, you're up. I said, no, Mr. Washington. Everybody says, no, not him. I said, they're right, Mr. Washington, not me. He said, Mr. Brown, you're up. Yes, sir. And I went out and pretty soon, when people laughed at me, it didn't bother me. They would throw paper and I could catch it without losing my concentration. And then one day, I came out and a hush went across the audience because it must have been something about me that indicated that I had come to myself. And Mr. Washington had been practicing with me to give a presentation. And I looked at the audience and I said, I choose not to be a common man. It's my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dull by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk, to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. I refuse to live from hand to mouth. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the stale calm of utopia. I will never cower before any master, nor bend to any threat. It's my heritage to stand erect, proud and unafraid, to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. Girl stood up and said, that's my boyfriend, honey. I like me some mess now, baby. <laughs> but I didn't start off like that. 
You have something special. You have talents and abilities in you that you don't even know. So how do we begin to create wealth? Let me give you some, some ideas. Number one, write this down, knowledge. What knowledge that you have in this economy, part of what we need, that people are willing to pay you for that. Next is talent. What talent? Dion's talent is playing football. I didn't have that as a talent. My talent is talking. To me, said my definition of success is doing what you love to do and find somebody to pay you to do it. <laughs> so I find people to pay me to talk. I talk. I brought a game to this, to this country called Beard Whist that I invented. And that's how I talk. I shoot pool. I signify. I make you tear up your cards, break your pew stick, because I talk a lot of trash. I throw you off. You've never been to Boston. I'll take you there. So I learned how to signify and talk trash, all right? And so I make a living talking trash to AT&T. I make more in one hour than 90% of the American public earn working for a whole year doing what I love to do. That I've developed my talent. You want to master your talent. Find out what it is that you love to do. I love to talk. Scripture is another key that says to us what we need to do to begin to develop ourselves. Luke 12, 34, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what do you love to do? And then explore ways in which you can earn a living doing that. Cooking, writing, painting, working with numbers, working with people. The other thing is not only must you have knowledge, talent, some skill, but the other thing that's important, faith to act on whatever your dream is. See, if you don't believe in yourself, how many people you know that have a lot of talent, a lot of abilities, but they don't believe in themselves? Raise your hands. See, that faith is very important. So the faith to act on those dreams, those desires. Here's scripture that I, that I like very much. Proverbs 16, 16 chapter, third verse. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Commit means to carry into action deliberately. Commit means to make it happen no matter what. Commitment is the difference between next time you have bacon and eggs. The chicken was involved. The pig was committed. He had to give it all up. That's going to take a minute to sink in. No, all right? See, when you make a commitment, I'm going to become wealthy. When you make it important, when you decide I'm going to do it no matter what, Life changes for you. See, most people don't keep their commitments to their commitments. That's why they lead lives of poverty, lives of misery, lives of unhappiness. Socrates said the uncommitted life isn't worth living. So part of what you must do, whatever commitment, whatever covenant you make with God while you're here, to go back to be a better father, to go back to make a difference in the community, to go back to change your life, to decide not to ever to use drugs or alcohol again, to decide to bet that you're going to begin to recreate yourself, that you're going to be reborn to a new state of consciousness. Whatever commitment that you make, keep your commitment to your commitment. No matter what, if it's hard, then do it hard. But keep your commitment to your commitment.